everybody, and welcome to the second episode of Advertising Europe from the EACA. As we get into the flow of a new year, it seemed relevant to start with probably the most important component of any marketing company's assets, their people. And particularly as we come into this year, hopefully moving from a pandemic to an endemic COVID world, although that does appear to be one of uh, at least one step forward, two steps back, or the other way around, depending on where we are at any given time. Um, it is time, I think, to focus again as people talk about the great resignation, the great reevaluation, as the whole way we think about talent has to change fundamentally. It seems quite fortunate that of the many things that we surprisingly managed to achieve in the past couple of difficult years, the first of which was producing the world's first global survey of the marketing services industry um, from a DE&I perspective. This was a remarkable achievement at any time, I think, because it hasn't been done before. And I think what was also incredible was the number of organizations that stepped up and joined into the fray, actually in very short notice. So um, first of all, you know, our thanks to, to the UK, to the Advertising Association, to ISBAR, and to the IPA for kicking off their all-in survey, which was the, um, you know, we borrow proudly from that, I think. Um, that was really the first uh, effort to look at this in a market context. And then in particular to the leadership of the WFA who picked up on that, um, got right behind it and then have sort of dragged the rest of us along with them in terms of supporting this initiative. And we at the EACA were delighted to be, a, to be an overall part of that and delighted to have everyone together today. So we, we released the findings at the end of last year, but you know the end of the year was a bit of a crazy time for everyone. So it was good to get that data out there. But what we really wanted to do today was to have a look at the implication of that both globally of course, for us in the region, and then from a market perspective in terms of so where we are, and then to have some sense of where we go with this, because this is, this is you know, it's a great start, but it's only, a, as I'm sure we're here, a foundation program for us. So I'm delighted today to have um, three guests with me. Um, Will Gilroy, who's the WFA's Director of Policy and Communications, and he has been the, uh, the real driver of this overall program globally. Um, I think he may be suffering from COVID today, so he's doubly brave uh, in terms of joining us. So thank you, Will, for uh, doing that. In a second, Will's going to um, take us through a sort of uh, top 10, I think, of the, uh, of the findings of the, of the global survey. Um, I will then hand over to Faye Rancock, who is the uh, newly appointed, because this is a fairly new initiative for us uh, in the region, head of our uh, EACA task force for a DEI in the region. Um, also working for Havas um, as head of uh, PR and communications uh, on her day job, like all of us have. Um, and then after we've talked about where we are in the region, I will then dive down into a market. One of the markets that did, I think, quite well, so I'll spare your blushes uh, in terms of the current survey. But also, it may not be, um, you know, it may not be uh, inconsequential that the, the Belgian Association has been very active in both you know, taking these findings and then trying to broaden them and make them as relevant for the market as, as they can be. So I'm delighted to have uh, Johan van der Poel, who's the CEO of the Belgian uh, Advertising Association with us, and we'll hear from his perspective on an individual market basis. So that's quite enough from me to start us off. So um, Will, can you give us your top 10? Yeah, sure. Um, Paul, thank you very much uh, for inviting us along. Um, I should say at the outset, uh, thank you to uh, EACA as well for being we, we more than um, we didn't have to drag you along at all. The EACA was a very willing partner in all of this. Um, I think it's fair to say. Um, I think a lot of us have taken a step back and said this was the biggest ever industry collaboration by the marketing global marketing industry, and EACA played a really really key role uh, in driving responses across. Uh, the agencies and so we, we've been delighted uh, with that and thank you for being a, a brilliant partner and I'm really happy to be able to go through my sort of top 10 hits if you like of what the research tells us um, but, but very quickly you can also find those um, uh, the, the report that we launched in early December last year and a, a short video clip uh, as well which goes through those top 10s uh, on our website at wfanet.org forward slash diversity so Without further ado, my top 10 um, takeouts from, from the research. Um, the first thing, uh, as if anyone needed a business case for why we need to get DEI right, one in seven say that they could leave the industry on the basis of a lack of diversity and inclusion. 
pretty uh, uh, um, heavy hitting results there. So we need to get this right. The most common form of discrimination, secondly, uh, was reported on the basis of family status, and that means caregivers for children, the elderly or the sick, and age. And taken together, this most often hinders women's career progression. Just a stat I've pulled out, 47% of women uh, with dependent children say family status can hinder one's career. That's one in two. Um, very impactful. The third thing uh, uh, from my top 10 is compounding this. The lived experiences of women in our industry are consistently poorer than the lived experiences of men. Women score 61% on Kantar's inclusion index compared to 69% for men. And nearly in every country surveyed, we had a 10 point difference between men and women, and sometimes considerably more. Um, and that's where you really see uh, the concerns. It's not in seeing the global data, it's, it's, it's focusing in on some of the, the data in specific markets where we see the really tough stories that people are living. Number four, maybe unsurprisingly, given what I've just said under two and three, this is most often, there's very often a gender pay gap. And even in uh, C-suite jobs, women are experiencing a 13% pay gap compared to men. In some countries, that gap is startling. Um, but as an average globally, it's 13% for C-suite positions. Top take out number five, the lived experiences of ethnic minorities are notably poorer than the ethnic majority counterparts. And this reduces this, this reduces sense of belonging and, and career progression. Uh, issues around ethnic minorities, however, are complex. They need to be taken on a case by case basis. If you think about South Africa, for instance, of course, the people living the worst experiences are black South Africans, but they're in an ethnic majority. Uh, if you look at Singapore, um, there's a lot of ethnic minorities, expats who are in senior jobs, who are making more money, uh, and therefore they're living better experiences. If you look at Malaysia, um, the ethnic majority is very often not leading in business. It's often a Chinese minority. Uh, and so you need to take this on a case by case basis, and you can't take as a one size fits all. Um, but I think it's useful here to bear in mind what we've said about women living worse experiences, Ethnic minorities living in worse experience. What does this mean in, in practice? Digging into what we mean by poorer lived experience in practical terms, women and ethnic minorities both report be, feeling um, undervalued versus colleagues of equal competence and being un, unfairly spoken over in meetings. This is the kind of uh, uh, practical thing that they are reporting when they say we're living worse experiences. Number six on our top 10. Uh, LGBTQ respondents at 60% score lower on the Kantar Inclusion Index than heterosexual counterparts at 65%. And they report a higher presence of negative behavior and feeling more generally anxious on the job. Number seven, people with disabilities are underrepresented in our industry um, by quite significant amount. Um, globally, the... Uh, uh, um, people with disabilities, I think it's roughly 15%, uh, our industry seems to be in the, in, in the region of 7%. Reported disabilities are more often than not mental or cognitive. 71% reporting disabilities reported mental and cognitive disabilities. But very few people, four in 10, tell their employer. And this makes the problem uh, uh, an invisible one and very difficult for, for employers to address. And so a big red flag there for um, responsible employers in our industry. Linked to this, of course, you know, we can't get away from COVID. I can't get away from COVID, as Paul mentioned. Um, uh, a third of respondents currently report feeling stressed and anxious at work um, since lockdown. That's no doubt uh, in light of current working um, situation. My ninth uh, top takeout is two thirds positively say that their companies are taking po positive action uh, to address diversity and inclusion, which is great. 
but this really masks a huge difference in responses from country to country. We have on one end of the scale, the US and Canada, uh, where you're talking an 80% plus um, of respondents saying that our companies are taking positive action to direct, address diversity and inclusion, maybe linked to uh, um, uh, tragic murder of George Floyd, which happened at the outset of, uh, uh, of COVID, maybe linked to Me Too movements, which happened obviously before. This figure, however, drops to 26%. And, and it's not just uh, in one region where we're seeing that, we're seeing countries in Europe, in Latin America, and in Asia Pacific, where that figure is very, very low. So clearly we have a lot of work to do at a global level. And my very final takeout um, is, perhaps on a more positive note, is all said and done, the marketing industry does score quite well at 64% on Kantar's inclusion index, ahead of uh, other industries. Um, second, it was uh, education, uh, pharma and healthcare, all scoring um, 60%. So a slightly more positive note to end on. Um, uh, and basically our baseline is, is higher than some on which to build, but that doesn't detract from the need to, to, to do a lot of work as the other nine points indicate. Great. Well, thank you, Will. I, I won't ask any questions right now because I'd like to uh, kind of bring this right back to uh, this is advertising Europe to the European uh, context. And of course, also that survey is client organizations as well as agencies. So there's, there's a, and I don't think it's that easy to distinguish between the two at this stage in the process, though maybe we'll come on to that a little bit later. And we know there's a lot of movement between the two organizations anyway. But um, Faye, how do, you, how do you react to these findings and, and what do you think the implications for us in Europe are? Yeah, hi Paul. Um, I think it's really interesting. I, look, we, you know, the value of the data is so important to us, isn't it? We can't know where we're going if we don't know where we're at. So the crucial role of having the data, and this is just the first stage of that data, and I know that our ambition is to grow the, you know, the number of people who engage with the, with the survey and to roll that out so that we can reach more and more people and, and, and have an even greater sample size, I suppose, which is a really important ambition for us to aim for. Um, but, but look, the value of having the story there in terms of the data is, is understanding where we're at now and where we need to get to. Um, I think it's important to always remember that behind the data is the in real life experiences, the lived experiences of all those people who work in our businesses. They're our colleagues and our friends. So I think it's also really important for us to remember the human aspects of all of this, which is um, we can look at numbers and we can celebrate some success in some places, and we can talk about 13% pay gaps in some of our in some of our you know regions, for example. But that means that there's a female CEO somewhere who's being paid 13% less than her male counterpart doing the exact same job. Now I think it's inexcusable. I don't think we can be in a world now with our, with our businesses where that happens anymore. It's one thing for us to talk about pay gap and to contend contextualize pay gap in the sense that there are more senior men in our businesses than there are women so therefore the men are paid more collectively on an average than the women are and we all understand that and that's a harder thing to address that takes time and it's about development and it's about removing barriers to women's progression at work and all those things which we know are more nuanced and complex than perhaps what the the simple question of pay if a man and a woman are in the same job, in the same role in, an, in a business, they shouldn't be being paid differently for it. It's just inexcusable in this day and age. So I feel like there are different things for us to address and understanding this data picture allows us to begin to address some of those things. So I think fabulous. When we talk about in individual agencies, in individual lives, we need to ask ourselves what will work here today, this week, this year, versus what will work somewhere else in a different market, in a different business, because we all have different cultures and we all have different relationships. And I think we have to remember that in the context of everything we're doing here. Yeah, absolutely. And I think those of us that you know, work across in regional jobs appreciate that when you raise a question like this in this area, in, you know, in certain parts of Eastern Europe, in Southern Europe, or in Northern Europe, you sometimes get quite a different overall initial response. Um, and even even perhaps asking people to reframe the question a little bit because uh, you know the cultural context drives so much. But, but I thought what was, things, in, what was oh sorry sorry I don't mean to interrupt oh, you. No, but I was please, just saying, please, there are some please. 
some things that, that feel universal, aren't there? That, you know, this question about the great resignation and, you know, people abandoning our businesses and our industry um, in droves. I mean, I, you know, I don't want to be hysterical about that, but the reality is that that is happening. And, and we hear from this research itself that we've got, we face a genuine crisis within our industry if we don't get these things right, if we don't address these problems. And I think that's true almost everywhere that isn't unique to a particular you know market or region that's true in all of our we're hearing that across our business which is that we, there's a challenge there about keeping people on our businesses and making working post covid and you know in this new world a, a pleasurable thing to do a place an industry that people want to stay and work in absolutely and i thought it was very encouraging the number of markets within europe who actually signed up for this program because I was slightly concerned that it, there was a view this is perhaps a, you know, a bit of an Anglo-Saxon issue. Of course it's not, but that is sometimes the perception. But actually we had very good participation and very good engagement. Even markets, uh, I think at, a, at an industry level locally saying, well, perhaps there isn't enough discussion about this, but this is the right way to get that conversation started. And then to refine it in a way that makes sense for us in our, in our local you know, communities that we work in. So maybe on that, this is a good point to, uh, to hand over to, uh, to the Belgian situation. Um, Johan, uh, what have you been doing with this, uh, with this area and with the results so far in, in Belgium? Yeah, first of all, let me tell you that we were quite surprised that uh, the results were so excellent for Belgium. And we were at the point that we were even wondering um, that the reason might be that we are not diverse enough or less diverse than other countries and that everybody's happy with the situation as it is right now. But of course, <clears throat> when you look at the question, <clears throat> I'm so sorry, um, if uh, the people are happy with what their company is doing regarding diversity and, in, and then, then we see that the results are far less uh, okay so there still is an issue. And of course, you have to know your place as an association. Um, we are not running the companies, um, the agencies, nor the brands. Um, so the only thing we can do is collaborate uh, with other associations and make sure that we put the topic high on the agenda. And that's exactly what we did. So um, we sat together with the Union of the Belgian Advertisers um, and also with the Union of the Media Agencies, which is separate in Belgium. And um, we, um, we decided to uh, focus on one of the two aspects, because there is one aspect of diversity and inclusion, which is on the work floor, uh, what we've been talking about still now. And then there's the other, uh, the other aspect, which is in the communication. Um, how well are we representing all kind of different minorities? Uh, in our communication? And we decided to focus on that one, because that's what links both the brands and the agencies. Um, and we found that there was this um, nice uh, guide uh, uh, produced by WFA, which is called the Diversity and Representation Guide for the Creative Process. And it sets well in 12 steps going from just uh, the, the, the positioning of the brand, going until the evaluation of the campaign, how you should do, how you should do to make it more inclusive to to have more representation. Um, so what we did was we um, we reproduced that that guide uh, into a Belgian version uh, with Belgian examples and Belgian cases uh, for each of the 12 steps. And we added some kind of a self scan so that agencies can see how far they are on the, in terms of DNI. Um, and, and, and if they are feeling that mm, they're not really scoring very well, then we give them a helpline where they can get in, uh, where they can get more information on how they should work on that on that on that issue. Um, but that's only, of course, that's one guide which we sealed with a B two B magazine that is sent to like all the major marketers and ma major advertising agencies. But on top of that, we um, we organized interviews which are being published in our major trade press every month, twelve months in a row. And every month on one of the 12 topics of the DNI guide. And there we ask um, people who are either working in uh, at a, at a marketing company or an agency, we ask how they are doing it in their company. And we try to lead by example and inspire other people who will read these articles 
whom we also post on our own uh, channels, the, the channels of UBA, of ACC, of UMA. Uh, we post them every month. We release a new uh, article. Um, and, and that's the, the purpose to, to inspire other companies to do better and to, to make it feel as if somebody has already done it before. So it must be possible for them as well. Because it's only when you have role models that you can aspire to do better as well. That's, that's how we go about it. Yeah, I mean, we, we know that none of our organizations are particularly you know, well resourced uh, and it's largely volunteer effort. So I think that sounds like a, you know, a remarkable amount of activity to manage to put into the marketplace. And I think so much more powerful because it's a collective effort across the whole industry. Uh, it just gives it much more authority, I think. Um, Faith, are there other markets that are doing interesting things uh, in the region that you've, you've come across? Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, in the UK business, you know, it depends on the maturity and the context um, of where a, where a market is at with regards to DNI. I mean, it's interesting that, you know, we do have we do have the complication with Europe in that some countries where you can't for ethnicity, for example, you can't mm -hmm. gather that data. It's it's not legal, and that that yeah. presents a real challenge because, as I said right at the very beginning, if you don't know where you're at, you don't know where you're going. So, you know that that is a difficult challenge. And and I was just in a conversation yesterday with our team in France about that exact issue, and we we can continue to address it because they're working really hard on making sure that the recruitment and engagement and community work that they the agencies are doing is still there because even though they don't know what the picture is in truth they have a good sense there's there's a mm -hmm. there's a, a belief that they do not doing too bad but could be better and i think we probably all know that to a degree so so just because we can't gather the data doesn't mean the work can, doesn't have to happen of course the work has to happen and i think johan's point about our work that we put out into the world as agencies and as, as as marketers is is really important it's as much the job um but we have to make sure we're not doing that for a box ticking exercise we have to make sure that that's done you know with truth and with understanding and that requires training and it requires a depth of understanding of each other and a mutual respect for each other in our workplaces that is about culture and our businesses cultures and I think that is a harder thing to crack at a group level we have to ask our businesses to be truthful with themselves about where they are on that journey and without the data that's difficult to do but we know that it can be done and we know in some parts of, of our regions we're doing it really well we know that in the uk we have a, a huge amount of work that's spearheaded by the other associations like the ipa and 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 the others that, that do allow us to to group together as an industry and make progress but we're also doing that on an individual level i mean we then have us as UK business, we created something called the press pause policy. And we then open sourced that and shared that with the entire industry. Because once we developed it, we realized how important it was. And it was, wasn't something that we could sit on and own just for ourselves. And that policy allows our people within any context, in any meeting, in any environment where they're at work, um, where something that they're uncomfortable with has happened or been said or taken place, they have an opportunity to press pause on that conversation or on that meeting to allow everyone to walk away and for us to assess what's happened and to maturely and with time and with thought and not, you know, instinct um, to, to address what's happened and to ask whether we've done something, you know, correctly, whether we can come back and, and have another go. And, and that has been incredibly empowering for our people and, and our clients, and we're sharing it within our, for, with our clients and beyond. And I think those types of actions are, are quite easy to do and not always easy to share. And I think that's where our role uh, at the EACA and, and anywhere else, WFA, anywhere else where we can have that influence to share those best examples of best practice and make sure that we're inspiring others to do the same, then, then we're getting our yeah. job done. Yeah, can I elaborate um, on that? Will. Or, sure, sure. Go ahead, Go ahead. Uh, Will, um, I just wonder whether you have um, any other examples, you know, outside of our region where, where you've seen a real sort of galvanizing effort in markets that perhaps we could learn from. Yeah, I wanted to pick up on, if, if I may, um, like pick up on one thing that Faye said, and then I'll, I'll segue on to, to what you, you've asked, Paul. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm a conscious as well you know, around the AACA network, there'll be lots of countries sitting there going, why weren't we part of this survey? And so I wanted to come to that because um, 
because I, I think that's sort of worth it, worthy of explanation. It, this was um, a, 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 a proof of concept. Um, we had a limited budget at the time, um, and it's incredibly complex because the questions you can ask in different countries are very different, of course, from, from country to country. So we had literally an army of lawyers um, <laughs> internally with Kantar, we had four or five people on our team. We had lawyers in every country checking that it's legally okay and that it's fulfilling, you know, um, it's culture, you know, it, it's it, it's make it's in line with cultural sensitivities, the things that we're asking. And when you're doing this across 27 countries and you're asking, you know, really personal questions, you know, from Japan to Malaysia to Saudi to Brazil, uh, you know, across 27 very different countries, um, this was a tough, tough ask. And, and I'm conscious that there weren't that many European countries in the first set, um, because actually they were, <clears throat> we, we, we had to limit it by region. So while there was a good turnout of countries, I'm conscious that um, afterwards we had Germany, Norway, Finland coming back going, why weren't we involved? And, and, and the promise is that you know, we'll involve more people in wave two, which will happen in, in 2023. Uh, this was to try and get proof of concept, and we were delighted with what we got, so 10,000 responses from 27 different countries. But we had budgetary uh, uh, requirements, and we had um, just the simple legal requirements to sort of get us up, up on, off the ground. Now, to Paul's question about you know, what, what we're witnessing around the world, looking at the global averages which I presented, you don't get the real picture. It's digging into the, the specific data at local level, which you, where you get the the real human stories of people's and cohorts lived experiences. And sometimes those, those lived experiences are, are tragic. Um, women in certain countries, ethnic minorities in certain countries, they are not so stark as you might imagine in Europe as they may be in parts of uh, 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 Asia Pacific, Latin America, um, uh, or even Africa. But um, there are some um, important stories uh, about what industry is doing about them in uh, that those challenges in different parts of the world um, you can see for example uh, how the unstereotype alliance uh, network is dri driving some real progress in terms of um, women in front of and behind the camera in countries like brazil countries like south africa turkey uh, and so on um, and this is this is this is uh, a key part of the uh, of the, the response to the challenge which is being laid clear by the data. Absolutely. And I, and I think also we've seen, and again, Faye can probably talk to this more, just taking this beyond the sort of almost the HR frame into things like the brand safety work that's being done by the media agencies in terms of, you know, the procurement work that we've talked about in terms of agency selection criteria. So, you know, there's, there's an there's a HR core to this, but actually it fundamentally impacts all aspects of our business when you really think it through, uh, which suggests just, again, just how significant this, this initiative is. So, so Will, you touched really upon... The... Oh, sorry, Paul. It's a really important point, actually. I think, you know, within our business, for example, our global CEO, Chris Hurst, is actually embedded um, DNI progress in every KPI of every business that reports into him. So this is not this is not a, a, a vertical in silo anymore. And I hate using phrases that are like jargon like that. But but in truth, it's not. It's now become the job of every single person in every single part of our businesses, from the most junior to the most senior. Inclusivity and making people feel like they're a part of it, all in it together, is not something that belongs to one person in one person's job title. That is something that we all have to take some responsibility for within our businesses, for sure. Yeah, and, and Faye, that's exactly why, you know, a lot of our work is focused on trying to address creative bias in the, um, in, in, in the, um, um, it, it, try, trying, to, trying to address unconscious bias in the creative process. Um, we've just launched a mini guide on um, uh, unconscious bias in, um, bias in the media buying process. You know, it's all part and parcel of the same thing, but it's uh, born from our conviction that you can only um, achieve true diversity, um, uh, equality and uh, equity and inclusion if you've got a workforce which represents at least the society in which you're operating. And so this is where it starts, I guess. OK, well, we, we've, we've covered, I think, most of the core subject matter, maybe just to look to the future as we uh, before we close this out. So you, you talked about the next survey coming out in 2023. 
and being more broadly. Is there anything else we should know about that? Anything else we can do to help? Yeah, I mean, always. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, you know, we, we were delighted to have 160 organizations globally sort of supporting us and, and EACA uh, and Tamara and team were, um, were absolutely amazing in terms of making sure we got this, this pilot project, if you like, up and off the ground. What we'd like to have, I think, is, is, is more countries, um, even though covering 27 countries was, was tough for all the reasons I've explained. Um, but I think we need, to, we need to cover more countries going forward so that we can give people the baseline data so that they can, because this always is going to be managed and driven at a local level, um, to be able to drive progress at a local level. Um, we need other companies like Havas have, have been a brilliant supporter, like WPP was a brilliant supporter. We need all the other agency groups. Uh, by and large, most of the agency groups are on board, um, but not all of them. And we'd love to see all of them sign up in, in, in 2023. And of course, we'd like more, more of our members, more of the big brands um, supporting this initiative in, in 2023. We hope that we can uh, make it bigger, better and more impactful. Um, in 2023 with a view to presenting the results in 2023 in Cannes. I'll add Great. only one point to that, Paul, which is that um, I would like for us to, ad to look at how we address that question about mental health and wellness and neurodiversity within our businesses. I think we are all very acutely aware of the DE&I um, you know, role, I suppose, of, of the gender equality questions and ethnicity. Um, I think this area, not so much disability as such, because I think I'm slightly uncomfortable with that as a phrase, when we hear the volume of people reporting stress and anxiety and mental health and wellness issues at work and post COVID, the demands returning very rapidly to our, to our industry and um, through our clients and, and, and everything to, to address and, and perhaps take that as a particular area of focus for us in 2023, I would, you know, or, or this year and into next year, I would like us to start to think about that. I think the number of people reporting issues around that and that stigma that means that they're not telling their employers about it is definitely an area where I think we have a responsibility to address. Yeah, and we probably don't need any more data to help to tell us that's the right way to go right into as a priority. We can feel that. Do you have enough support from, from members across the uh, EACA in, in your uh, task force and in, in the engagement team? Do you need more? We could all, we're always we're always asked for more, won't we? Um, you'll never hear a person who went offered for the offer of help say, no, thanks, I'm all good. <laughs> no, uh, look, we have a great, there's a great representation in that group. Um, and there are a bunch of very committed and hard work, hardworking individuals with, as you mentioned at the beginning, day jobs. Um, but I think what, what I would say to echo Will's point is the more agencies, marketers, clients, the more, more individuals and organizations that, that agree to become a part of the next round of this, the, the more robust the understanding of where we're at gets. And the more robust our understanding is, the better we can drive and develop the solutions. So there's no question in my mind that that's where we need to get to. Um, I believe we can get there. And I believe if more and more of our agencies and businesses are willing to get take part, we'll, we'll, we'll do better. And by the way, Faye, if, if companies like WPP um, or Publicis or Omnicom are, are, are part of this, then they get enough responses. They can benchmark themselves against the industry average, which is very meaningful in terms of being able to drive progress as an organization. Yeah, and I think also would give us some sense of benchmarking against you know the the other components of the industry as well, which would be which would be uh, very interesting for us. So uh, anyone who's watching this and wants to get involved, uh, you know where to find uh, Faye. She's uh, there's plenty to do. Um, Johan, just you've done so much in your market, but it, obviously there's more to do. What what what's next on the agenda for you from a from a Belgian perspective? Yeah, we looked into the biggest issue which we have in terms of uh, DNI. Uh, and it seems to be, in Belgium, it seems to be um, the ethnic mi minorities in the sense that we have like 10 to 15% of uh, Muslim people living, integrating uh, in, in Belgium, uh, which means they have a Muslim background, but they've been here for generations, but they still can't find a way to our agencies. Um, 
which means that we're living separately from each other more and more. And also in communication, we don't reach them anymore. We don't know their media channels. We don't know anything about, about that community, which is growing every year. So what we did was we, um, we did some focus groups with people with migration background uh, from our agencies. Um, and we tried to figure out what the problem was. And then we, there were some two, three main reasons. The first one being that they don't have any role models. Uh, in our agencies, working in our agencies. And secondly, that they don't think this is a job with a high esteem. Their parents want them to do a job with high esteem. And thirdly, they feel that they're not gonna uh, get well integrated in an agency because it's all about partying and celebrations and drinking alcohol and, and, and selling things that they don't, don't, don't always uh, would sell by themselves. Um, so what we're doing now is um, we found a huge community of people with migration background that are ready to go into the marketplace and we're collaborating with them and we're organizing um, immersion days for the managers of the agencies, which are which is a day in which they go and visit lots of different organizations from uh, people with migration background and they learn how to turn their agency into a uh, not into a hostile, but into a welcoming agency so that um, they can go, so that people who join them with a migration background feel well accepted and feel and don't feel as if they are the quails in the bird cage, uh, but feel as if the company is taking care of them. And secondly, we're organizing um, uh, road shows um, with youngsters, like 25 youngsters per day with whom we visit three different agencies and in the first agency they get a briefing the second agency they get uh, they work on a creative plan and the third agency they do a, they produce a radio commercial and those people we keep them in the loop we invite them for all kind of um, uh, training sessions that we do we invite them for speed dating sessions we invite them for whatever we do and and that for us is a way as an association to help our members both the managers to understand better how they should reorganize their agency and how they can um, find the talent with migration background. That's our main focus right now. That, that's, it. I think, incredible and also something that has so obvious appeal to so many markets in the region. It's almost something that you could just take as a plug and play. And I know the, 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 the sort of network side of things, the associations are very good at sharing best practice. Because uh, some of them are obviously very, very lightly resourced indeed. So the, the ability to take some of that off the shelf and deploy it in the market, though that will be relevant for, for our bigger markets too, actually. But so that, that's a great initiative. So I, I'm conscious that we probably, um, probably run out of time now. Um, obviously, this is a huge subject, and it's not something we're going to wait until 2023 to come back and revisit. We may choose to deep dive a little bit more into some of the specifics of this as the, as the whole story unfolds. But I think um, it's a new year, let's be positive. 64% on the inclusion index isn't too bad as an industry. We all know there's a hell of a lot more to do in this area, but let's at least celebrate that we have a good foundation, we have some data, and I think broadly we have some good indications of where we wanna go. So this story will be continued. Uh, thank you all for participating today. Will, we'd never have guessed you had COVID uh, unless you told us ahead of time. So thanks for uh, soldiering through. Um, and uh, stay tuned for the next uh, issue of uh, Advertising Europe, which will be coming very soon. Thank you.